Thanks for joining tonight's conversation about autism. We'll be talking about safety. Tune in at 7 p.m. Thanks for joining tonight's conversation about autism. They'll be get, talking about safety. We'll be get started shortly. Well, thank you for tuning in tonight to Conversations About Autism. My name is Jennifer Mannheim, and I'll be your host this evening. Tonight's topic focuses on safety. We'll talk about efforts parents and autistic individuals can make to reduce threats to safety, as well as what they can do when they find themselves in a crisis and the need of police support. At the end, we'll also have some links to additional resources that can support you in your journey. Although many of you listening tonight understand what autism is. There are still many in the world who do not, and we have a long way to go in advancing and spreading awareness about autism so that autistic individuals can safely engage in everyday activities such as taking a walk in their neighborhood without the worry of police being called. By hearing individual stories from families and individuals with autism, my hope is that we can better begin to understand each other and support each other. Tonight, I'll be using both identity first and person first language when talking with and about autistic individuals and individuals with autism. In a moment, I'm going to have our panel of experts introduce themselves. But first, I feel it's important to acknowledge that the lived experiences among people with disabilities, such as autism, and among racial and ethnic groups varies. Dr. Kimber Kimberly Crenshaw coined the term intersectionality to describe the experience of living with multiple identities, including gender, race, culture, disability, gender, identity, sexual orientation, immigration status, etc. This conversation tonight may be more challenging for those that experience the intersectionality of having autism and being a member of a racial or ethnic minority group. Although these challenges exist, the goal tonight is to share our experiences and learn from each other. I also want to acknowledge that for some individuals, having a police officer as part of the conversation can be a little triggering, triggering based on their experience or the experiences of those they know. I intentionally invited a police officer whom you will meet in a moment, and I think you'll agree with me is uh, pretty great. And I invited him based on his effort to really bridge that gap between the police and people with autism. All right, so uh, we uh, let's go ahead and bring all of our participants on. Um, and I'm gonna have our, our participants introduce themselves, where they work, their connection to autism. And since tonight's topic is going to be a more challenging one, I thought maybe we'd also talk about what we do when we're feeling overwhelmed 
and I will start off. So my name is Jennifer Mannheim. I'm a pediatric nurse practitioner at Seattle Children's Autism Center. And I chose a career in working with those with developmental disabilities after volunteering at a summer camp for kids with special needs. Shout out to Camp Camp in Center Point, Texas. Uh, I'm passionate about my work uh, because I love what I learn from the kids and the adults that I work with. Um, and when I feel overwhelmed, I have learned to try to take a deep breath. And sometimes one breath is not enough for me, so I need to take a 10 of them very slowly, which gives me enough time to pause. And then after that, I can decide if I can carry on or I need to go do something else. And so that's what I do. And so I'm gonna turn it now over to Tracy, if you wouldn't mind going next and telling us who you are, uh, connection to autism and what you do when you feel overwhelmed. Hello, Jennifer. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for having me tonight. So my name is Tracy Schneider. My husband and I have two boys, um, a 21-year-old Ben who was diagnosed with autism when he was three. And we have an 18-year-old um, son who is a freshman in college. And uh, my husband and I founded Ben's Fund in 2012 after a long journey of watching parents struggle getting their children support, um, specifically financially, but also just support knowing you're not alone. So we started Ben's Fund, which is a grant that um, helps families in the state of Washington children. And then we also started a young adult grant up to age 25 to help them be successful in their journey and support what they need when they need it. Um, I also started a business for our son, Ben, the one that has autism in 2021, he is an artist and that is his journey right now. So I started a business and able to support that. Um, so now I'm, I guess, uh, the CEO of uh, Small Ego Art. Um, I'm also doing shipping and administrative work and billing and all of that kind of stuff. Um, so uh, when I feel overwhelmed, I am a massive planner. Um, so I always jump into, uh, if I don't have the knowledge, getting the knowledge, and then I go into logistics and planning to try to fix whatever I'm, I'm dealing with at the time. So that's, that's kind of me. Awesome. Thanks for joining us tonight, Tracy. I am also a huge fan of Ben's Fund, by hey. the way. So thank you for starting that. And I did not know about your other venture but uh, talk about understanding what it means to be overwhelmed. <laughs> yes. Teenagers and organizing. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you, Tracy. Yeah, thank you. And, yes, excellent. And I think then we were going to turn to Karen. You want to go next? Sure. Um, so I'm Karen Wilkins Mickey. I am the mom of Caden Mickey, who is a senior in high school. And um, also mom to Kira Mickey, who is a sophomore in college at Arizona State University. Um, my connection to autism is Caden. Um, he was diagnosed when he was, I wanna say 20 months. Um, and so I've been on this journey for a long time. He's 17 and um, I don't know, it's so interesting. When I get overwhelmed, uh, what do I do? I think I try to stop, take a deep breath. First of all, I have to recognize that I'm overwhelmed because <laughs> I'm so busy and I do so much, but I just kind of stop and take a deep breath. And I just realize that, you know, everything will get done and everything will be okay. So that's what I do. Excellent. Thank you Yes, I'm super excited about you joining us, Karen. I know you're a busy person because in part of this, you were also going to like have to head out a little early because you're like catching a flight. <laughs> yeah. so the fact that you even made time for us, I'm so grateful that you're here. Always. Sharing. It's important. Yes. Sharing oh, and I have Ben's art in my office, but you can't see it because my head is in the way. The reflection, he, oh. his art is in my office. So um, he's an amazing artist. I've got to look into this too. I'm I'm a big fan of uh, of art. So oh, please well, do. Yes. <laughs> well, thank you, Karen. Welcome for welcome. Uh, glad you're here tonight, Chris. I'm going to have you go next. Sure. Hi, everybody. Nice nice to meet you. Uh, my name is Chris Christman. I am a police officer with the Seattle Police Department. 
Uh, I've been a police officer for just about 28 years now. Feb February 2nd will be my 28 year anniversary. So it's just, you know, right over the horizon here in a couple of weeks. Um, I am currently assigned to the uh, Washington State Criminal Justice Training Commission's State Police Academy here in Burien, Washington, as, as a TAC officer slash instructor. Uh, I've been down here at the State Academy only a few months. I, I came down here in September. Uh, prior to that, I was assigned to SPD's training unit as a full-time instructor there for about the last six years or so. Uh, and as part of my duties with SPD, uh, and actually started with SPD, I guess I should say, and then from there kind of blossomed to teaching it around the country, uh, I have been teaching a, a class on law enforcement and autism designed for police officers to un under, you know, better understand autism spectrum disorder and uh, you know, give them some information on how they can manage contacts and you know, possibly identify uh, people that may be on the spectrum if they're not sure if they are and just uh, try to increase uh, our, our ability to uh, work our way through those calls when, when, when we get them. Excellent. And what do you do when you feel overwhelmed, Chris? Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. Uh, well, right. so, so, similar to you and Karen, I guess I when I think of overwhelmed, I think of in the moment kind of overwhelmed. So I'm, I'm a big believer in breathing. Uh, there's a specific technique called box breathing that I'm a big fan of. And essentially what that is, is breathe in for, you'll hear a lot of times like described as breathe in for four count, hold for a four count, exhale for a four count, and then hold for a four count. That's why they call it box breathing at your four sides of the box and then just repeat as necessary. So I'm a, I'm a big believer of that because I feel like when I get overwhelmed, I tend to tense up and you're not, not breathing a lot and not getting a lot of oxygen into your body. So uh, I like breathing techniques as well. Excellent. Yes. And I will say too, I had the, I had the opportunity to observe your training um, that you did a few months ago and uh it was really really remarkable and as an autism expert i was really impressed with how you presented autism to this group who doesn't deal with it every day like i was just so amazed i'm so glad you're here and uh can share with us your knowledge because it's 28 years is a long time <laughs> thank you excellent all right now sydney it's your turn you want to tell us about you and uh, where you're working and what you are what you do when you're feeling overwhelmed. Um, all right, so hi, my name is Sydney Krebsbach and I am a individual with autism and I work for SNAP. I work for the University of Washington's Echo Autism Hub team and I serve on the Washington State Developmental Disabilities Council and I was diagnosed with autism when I was eight years old. I did not get fully diagnosed until then because it was in order for me to get more services in the state of Alaska. I lived in Alaska for 23 years and I was a part of the Alaska Governor's Council. I was a part of the Alaska LEND program and I worked several different jobs in between. And in May of 2021, I had to leave my life in Alaska for a new life in Washington. And I currently live in Spokane. Um, when I get overwhelmed, I would just take very deep breaths and then I would just exercise. Uh, yeah, exercise is a good one too. I think we've got breathing, we've got exercise, we've got our taskmasters. Uh, I think all of those are great things to do. So, um, and Sydney and I, well, first of all, Sydney, you have an incredible list of accomplishments and things that you're doing. Uh, it's impressive. And I'm glad you're here tonight because you're a great person to talk uh, to us about this topic. And you and I know each other through Echo. Uh, we both do Autism Echo. Um, so thank you for coming tonight. And my first question is gonna be for you, Sydney. Um, so let's see here. You, so you moved from a small town in Alaska and now you live in a bigger town in, in Washington. And so what kinds of things do you tend to worry about? Um, in big city? 
living yeah. in a big city right now, I just worry about all the crime that's been happening because there's just a lot more crime here than there was in Alaska. And yeah. I just worry about safety. You worry about your safety. Yeah, no. Um, and I know, have you ever felt you've been somewhat taken advantage of because of your autism? Is that something you feel like has happened to you? Yes, that has happened before because of my autism. Um, I was at the Tenala State Fair, and apparently I was approached by a woman who was selling perfume or makeup, and I didn't know how expensive it was, and they kept on trying, having me try all these different products, and then by the end, they said, oh, it's about $200, and I was like, what? You're having me pay that much money? And so I paid for it, and not knowing that it was expensive, and so I told them, I tried to tell them that, hey, I have autism, and when I was using this product, I wasn't thinking straight. Those are tough. That's such a tough situation. I'm sorry that happened to you, but I can see where then you also worry about your safety in general, being a larger city with more people. Um, around who could do that. That's, that's too bad. Yeah. But, yeah. But thank you. Thanks for sharing that part of your story. We're going to come back to you a little bit uh, and ask some more stuff about your life and lived experience. And there's one question I know we're going to ask that many parents are there are wondering about. So um, more to come from Sydney. But next, I'm going to turn it over to Tracy. Um, and Tracy, I know your son Ben's 21 and an adult and living on his own. Um, I'm sure that makes you both uh, proud and incredibly worried. Yes. Um, and so I can imagine safety uh, while he's alone is something that you've been planning for for a long time. And so when did you start taking steps to help support him in becoming independent? Like, how did that look for you in your journey? Well, I feel like going back on it, you know, he's, we've kind of always been preparing him for this. I feel like going back on all of the therapies and, and the social um, pieces that we've that we brought in, the ABA, you know, just all of those things have have taught him to be who he is today. Um, and teaching him to be a self advocate was a huge part of that. Um, you know, and watching him learn his coping skills. Um, you know, what does he do when he gets overwhelmed um, or nervous or uncomfortable? Um, and just teaching him all of those things is such a so that's a massive, um, you know, a task for them because it doesn't come sometimes naturally. But when he got into high school, that's kind of really when we started working on, okay, let's teach you how to make your own dinner. Let's teach you how to do laundry. Um, obviously, those things were very gradual and we did one at a time until he kind of mastered it. Um, but those were all things that we you know, that we kind of worked through. Um, and I, I leaned on that a lot with him too. It's kind of like, okay, this is, this is part of you maturing. This is part of you getting older. This is why we're doing this. And this is why I'm trying to teach you, um, all of these things to be self-sufficient because, you know, he always wanted, well, how about you do that part and I'll do this part. And I'm like, okay, this time, but then next time you can do all of it. So you actually know what it is that you're doing and, and how to do it. Um, so I think it was just, it was just a lot of, a lot of that, a lot of easing into it. Um, yeah, it was just a lot of easing into it, a lot of teaching. And he was, thankfully he was motivated because, you know, he did want to become independent and he liked being mature. Um, so that helped as well. Oh, that's great. That's a good story, I'm sure. Because Karen, I know your son is in high school right now. So I saw you like nodding your head. Like, I think that's probably a shared experience you guys uh, had. Yeah, yeah. And so I'm also curious, Tracy, when, um, when Ben was moving into his own space, were there any things that happened that were kind of planned or unexpected that occurred that made you kind of think more about like his safety? And it's going to be without mom and dad there as the backup. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, that made us extremely nervous, obviously, because he's been with us and we expected him to be with us for however long um, he needed before he was ready to to move on his own. He had very specific um, 
needs as well when he moved out. So just working through, through that, but yeah, I mean, I met, um, I used uh, connections to meet with the uh, police department of the city where he is living um, because obviously that was a huge concern of mine because Ben can come across, he's very thin, um, he's quirky, um, he can sometimes do, you know, strange movements that people might not understand. He always wears a hood up on top of his head because of his sensory, his sensory thing that makes him feel comfortable. Um, you know, so it, it was a massive worry for me that he would be misunderstood in public, um, by the police, um, all of that kind of stuff. So that's still a massive worry of mine. Um, so I met with, um, I met with someone from, from the police department, from, like I said, the city where he moved to. And I was like, all right, you know, let's dive into this. What do I, you know, what can I do? What, what does this look like? What do you guys have as far as capabilities to, you know, kind of tag is he, that he lives here and, um, all of this kind of stuff, you know, but, um, so that was a massive part of it. And then teaching him too, you know, like being safe and what that looks like and locking your doors, um, and, you know, having lights on outside and things like that. But we also jam packed his house with a lot of those security systems and floodlights and all of that kind of stuff too. Um, some of the stuff that was unexpected, um, was like the first night he moved in, we found out his water heater was broken and it wasn't working. Um, you know, so trying to get that replaced and what does that look like and having to come home to take a shower um, while we're waiting for your hot water heater to get replaced. I mean, flexibility, stuff like that. Planning holidays. Now that he's in his own place, how do we get him out um, and back to our home? Um, so we had to set expectations, you know, for holidays and things like that. And what does that look like? And how long do you need to be back at our, our house and um, and all of those things? And then even Halloween was a big one because it's like, I don't want people knocking on my door. I'm not going to open my door. I'm not going to hand out candy. Um, so, you know, so figuring that out, um, I made a sign, put it on his front door, like happy Halloween, trick or treat please take a couple and leave some for the next person and left out a, a bowl of candy. Um, you know, so just trying to dealing with his medicines too. Um, he has some health issues. So just trying to help him manage that. Um, but he also likes being in control and making him feel like he's an adult and he's part of these decisions too. So that's a, that was a big part of it for him that we were happy to do, but also making sure through all of those decisions and, and his taking control, um, he was safe and he, he was going to be okay. Like you said, without us there, which was what scared us the most. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing that Tracy. And I can see already the list that was made in your mind. And as you ticked it off, you became a little less overwhelmed and were able to kind of help support him. And, uh, <laughs> uh, that is awesome. And I could see Karen the whole time, like nodding, like she, cause you have both a high schooler now and a college student. So you probably experienced it both ends of that. And, um, and Karen also bringing you into this conversation here too. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about Caden as he's older, but, you know, being a parent of a son who's black, um, and knowing that you have to have that, the talk, the talk about police and safety, um, and that makes that talk even more necessary. Can you share with us some of what you've done to help educate and support him um, kind of in this world with his intersectionality of, of those two things? Yeah, I mean, I was, I was nodding my head because everything Tracy was saying, I was saying to myself like, yes, I have those worries and I have a black son. And so I always say, you know, parenting, being a mother of a black son, you parent a little differently and you worry a little differently. And there are things that I've had to do that I don't like doing, but I have to do them. I also call the police. And when he wants to go for walks, I'm like, I want everybody to know, like, he is not a threat. My son is very tall. He's about six, four. He's large. He's seven. He's only 17. He is a cuddly, warm, sweet, loving young boy. 
and he speaks to everyone. He says hello to everyone. So I had to send out a community message that if you see Caden, he is my son. He has autism. He likes walks. He wears his headphones because that for him makes him feel safe and comforted. But it worries me because he always has his headphones on. He always has his phone in hand. Um, and he's on Life360. So I know where he is as he's walking. He knows he can only do a certain route along the community. He's not to leave that route. He can do it over and over and over again if he wants to. But I feel most safe with him doing that. But the challenge is the, um, you know, you want your son to have independence. You want your child to have that independence, but the fear is there and it's real and it doesn't go away. And so I have to do the extra. I have to call the police department and let them know that my son is a large black young man. He's 17 and this is what his descriptors are. And he may not understand your command. So please be patient. Please do not, if he doesn't understand the first time, just talk to him because he's he's so kind, but he can be perceived as a threat if you just look at him. Just like Tracy said, you know, Ben wears a hood and, you know, and he may have a look that someone might think is suspicious until you have a conversation. So don't, and I understand, I know that, you know, a police officer has to always be on guard and always has to protect themselves. But it is hard for me to protect my son too and let him know that there are people that look like him that others might feel you are like them or are them and that they're threatened by you because of your mere stature or how you might be behaving or what you might be doing, spinning, whatever he's doing, it could be it could be in someone else's mind as, oh, that person, he must be up to no good. He must be on something. He doesn't belong here. I live in a predominantly white community. I am probably one of two black families in my community. So, you know, the good thing is, is that people know Caden because it's my family and everybody knows that. The bad thing is if somebody doesn't know that and they're driving by, or a police officer, I don't know, or if someone makes a call, then my son is that target, you know, over someone else. So it is it is something that I talk to my son about. Um, I was extremely nervous during um, everything that was happening with George Floyd, um, and it concerned me. Um, I, I, Ahmaud Arbery, we had a lot of conversations during that time. Um, we talked about when he goes for a walk and why I'm nervous. We talked about what do you do if a police officer approaches you? Sadly, my son's response to what you do when a police officer um, approaches you is was not what I expected. And it was it was very devastating to me because his response was to drop, put his hands behind his back not to say not he just go down and get in position that is not what i told him that is what he's seen that's what he saw on the internet that's what he's seen on television and i had to explain to him that not all cops are bad and that that doesn't happen to everyone and that i had to but you have to understand an autistic mind is very pure and what they see they believe until someone proves them differently so during this time of racial injustice and the things that are happening, you know, specifically, especially two years ago, he is, it's, you know, it's just all he's seeing and hearing. And so he's believing this. And so he leads with, was it a good officer? Is it a good, when if I say like, oh, I had, you know, I got a ticket and, you know, and he, he asked me, he's like, was it a good officer? Was he kind? Were you okay? He leads with that because that's his, that's what he has seen. So how do you parent, you know, how do you explain that not all people are bad? Yes, bad happens. No, you, yes, you can go for your walk, but you need to be alert and you need to, you have to realize not everybody wants to be your friend. 
you know, how do you balance that? How do you tell your son, like, go to school and make friends and whatever, but then there are people who are threatened by him because he's tall, he's black, he has autism, and he's strange to them. He's weird to them. So how, but then, so they are worried for their safety for, because he's just different than someone else. How do I explain to him that you are great, you are wonderful, you are kind, it's not you. It's others that don't understand you. So how, so the parenting part is challenging, you know, like, and I'm growing up with him on this. This is a journey for both of us. So my fears now, you know, every transition is hard, you know, elementary to middle school, middle school, to high school, high school has been really, really hard. You have the pandemic and then we have, you know, you go back in and people are feeling how they feel and it's uncomfortable for students. And all he wants to do is be like everybody else. Every other teenager that's in school, he wants to be like them, but they are not seeing him that way. He doesn't understand why I have to have this talk about taking a walk. He doesn't understand why I have to say, don't go too close to that girl because she's smaller than you you're taller than her in social like spatial distance social um cues are really important because it could be perceived that you're too close or you're threatening them and that happened and it and he didn't even understand what he did wrong so it is a huge it is a, a concern as he continues to transition um, I will tell you that the way I have always um, gone through this journey is one day at a time, and that's good and bad. I never looked far. I dealt with every day as it came, just one day at a time. I didn't want to think about, okay, in two years, he's going to be in high school. Oh, and another year, he's going to be in college. Oh, that, like, I didn't, I needed to, de- it was too overwhelming. So I dealt with everything one day at a time. But now the, what I learned is I got slapped in the face pretty much because I'm like, oh my gosh, we're here. He's a senior in high school and he's graduating. And every transition has been very, very challenging. The adjustments, adapting the new environments, explaining his autism. So I think, I, I just, I, I, I mean, for me, ditto to everything Tracy said, and my son is black. Well said, Karen. Thank you for sharing kind of those insights about what you were feeling, what you're thinking, and being so honest about it. I think uh, it resonates probably with many families, hopefully, who are watching this. Um, And part of what you said was, you know, having people understand who he is uh, and sharing that information. And um, so actually, the next question comes to Chris. Kind of following along that is of um, Chris and what you're doing in the program that you've created to train officers to better understand autism and how to identify those individuals with autism. So when they see someone like Caden walking down the street, if he's doing something a little unusual or Ben, they could maybe think other than, you know, like they could be think about what other reason that person might look like that. But so, yeah, tell, tell us um what are the, some of the topics you cover, Chris, when you talk to police officers? Sure, absolutely. Uh, the first thing I want to say is that, uh, you know, I, I knew this question was coming. So I, I kind of had in my mind uh, the idea of what what direction I wanted to go as I'm thinking about what I talk about in my class. And then I'm following up Karen and, and listening to her concerns, which were extremely well articulated and, and absolutely... Um, understandable why you why you would have those concerns. And so as I'm listening to her story, I'm kind of reconstructing and restructuring, thinking about how to uh, how to explain my class under under the umbrella of the concerns that that Karen's expressing. Um, because you know I I share uh, a lot of those similar concerns from from both a personal and a professional level. Um, but but speaking from the the professional level of teaching this class to other police officers, um, you know the her concerns as, as far as relative to her son are the exact 
thing that I'm trying to avoid. Like the out the outcomes that you know I would say is directly to Karen, which I can because you're you're sitting there looking at me on the screen. But like the the concerns that you have are absolutely one hundred percent the the exact thing. The, uh, sorry, exact thing that I'm trying to avoid with my class, and and that's why it's it's become or not why one of the reasons why it's become so important to me and why I've been you know, doing this as much as I can, because I'm trying to avoid those outcomes that the parents uh, are worried about. Oh, I think we lost Chris for a moment there. Oh, that's too bad. Did oh, my back? You're back. Yes. Oh, okay. Yes, I don't know what happened there, but um, oh, yeah. So I was just saying, yeah, those are the same concerns. And I really think Karen and I probably should have follow-up discussions later down the road relevant to this topic. Um, but as, as far as my class and just to, to give you guys a little bit of an idea what it looks like, I know Jen, you, you came and sat in on it. Um, in order to get the buy-in from, from the officers, I actually start out my class. I show a video from an incident that occurred down in Arizona a few years ago between a, a 14 year old boy named Connor Libel and a city of Buckeye, Arizona police officer. And it, it's one of those incidents, one of those contacts that as a, as someone who's been a police officer for 28 years, I watched that and I don't, I don't, wouldn't say horrified is a strong enough term to, to describe my feelings about that incident. It went, uh, it went sideways very quickly and in, and in a direction that that incident never should have gone. And the reason that I show it to start my class out is that essentially to get buy-in from, from the cops in my class. And what I tell them is, okay, yeah, that incident occurred in Buckeye, Arizona, but potentially any police officer that comes through my class could start out where that Buckeye officer started out at, as far as relative to that. It was, it was what we would call an on view. He was driving down the city street, uh, looked over into the park, saw Connor Libel stimming with some string, and thought his movements look, looked a little off and maybe they were consistent with some sort of drug or alcohol use. So he went to investigate, contacted Connor and it just, like I said, it went completely sideways from there. Um, but I talk about, yeah, you could, you know, see something that looks, and like Tracy and Karen both were talking about, see something that looks a little off, a little odd, a little suspicious. So you go to check it out. Cause I always tell them, you know, we're police officers. We get paid to be naturally curious and try and figure out what's going on. And the next thing you know, you've got in your head that it's somebody that's drunk or on drugs or something like that. And it's not, it's just some skinny 14 year old kid that's on the autism spectrum. And the officer in that incident had absolutely no clue about anything to do with autism. And that was why it devolved so rapidly and, and, and so poorly. And so that's, like I say, that's a hundred percent exactly what I'm trying to avoid with my class. And so I, you know, I talk about things such as, um, I, you know, however you want to phrase it, sometimes I'll call it traits, characteristics, indicators, um, signs, symptoms, whatever, whatever you want to phrase it. And I, you know, I go through a section on that of things to look for that might uh, help officers identify someone that's on the autism spectrum. And I talk about things such as, you know, eye contact avoidance. Um, I, I go into sensory issues and how that can affect uh, the, the contact that you may be on because as police officers, we bring lots of, and I would say stuff, but lots of sensory stuff, lots of sensory just issues with us wherever we go because of our, um, the badges and buttons and bright colors on, you know, bright stuff on a uniform, our, our red and blue strobes on our police cars, our sirens, even our portable radios that can squawk and stuff like that. So I, I talk about how sensory issues can affect our contacts. Uh, I have a, a section specifically based around stimming. Uh, what is stimming? What does it look like? How, to, how you can recognize it? Uh, and, you know, I refer back to the Connor libel incident because when the Buckeye officer goes to contact Connor, he asks, he asks Connor, what are you doing? And Connor says, I'm stimming. And the officer's immediate reaction is, huh? And so you can tell he has no clue. And so I, I tell our officers, like, this is this is what it is. This is what it how it presents. This is what it looks like. And if you hear the word stimming, pretty much immediately shift your brain to the autism spectrum because you really won't hear it anywhere else. 
you know, you'll, you'll hear things. And I tell them, you'll hear things like, well, neurotypical people stim too. But again, that's a direct autism related reference, you know? So I'm like, if you're stimming pretty much immediately shift your brain to autism mode and start thinking along those lines. Um, I talk about things like, uh, not to jump back too much, but with sensory issues, I talk about what I, I try to refer to as for us, like the, the sensory trifecta, as I refer to it, to, that can impact us. And what that could look like is you could end up with someone who uh, is attracted to bright, shiny objects or bright colors. That, that's that sensory seeking type type personality. And because of all the stimulus that that we bring with us, they might be attracted and maybe want to touch officers and check out their buttons and badges and gears. But also as part of that trifecta, the innate personal bubble that they might not necessarily understand how standing too close to us uh, would make us uncomfortable and, and stuff like that. And they might not understand yet how close is too close. Um, and so how that could potentially go sideways if you have someone that, um, you know, wants to be sensory seeking, they stand too close, they reach out and touch you and as officers, you can understand we get used to our our personal bubble, our officer safety bubble, and we don't like people getting too close and and violating that, as I say, or touching us and stuff like that because of just officer safety reasons. But one of the things that I, I tell our officers is that um, if you're on a call with someone that you know or you strongly suspect has autism based on the reasons and the, the signs and indicators I'm giving you, like just anticipate that that could happen. And if it does, I always tell them like, don't, don't freak out or don't like, oh my God, he went for my gun. Just anticipate it could happen. And if you need to move back, take a step back or ask them to step back, something along those lines, that that's absolutely fine. But, you know, I just uh, try to tell my officer, like, you know, basically keep your head about you and just understand this could happen. And if it does, don't, don't overreact to it for lack of a better word. Um, and then one, uh, you know, I talk about meltdowns. Um, how those can be related to sensory issues and how us responding to them, we could potentially further aggravate it again because of all the sensory stuff that we bring with us um, and how we can best respond to meltdown incidents if we get dispatched to those. And then I also have a pretty lengthy uh, segment relative to uh, wandering, missing persons, elopement, that kind of a thing. And, uh, you know, I talk about how how dangerous that is for, for the for the folks on the spectrum, if they do have that tendency to go wandering. And I, I think I, I explained when you were in class, I, I try to avoid statistics as much as I can because they do change from year to year. But for that class, I do use some of the statistics that are just like mind boggling high that I, I couldn't even believe that they were legitimate statistics. And so I've, you know, checked and rechecked and reconfirmed um, things like if we as police officers respond to an incident where there's a child who's under five years old with autism spectrum disorder, there's about a 60% chance that that child will, will uh, not survive that incident if it's a missing person's contact. And again, that's that number to me, it's, it's just mind boggling how high that is. Um, so along the lines of, you know, the missing persons, I talk about uh, the water, water obsession, water attraction, how, um, that plays into the lethality of the missing persons and the wanderings. And I talked to officers about, you know, if you get these calls, search your water sources, your nearby water sources first, um, because there's there's a high likelihood that, that water could be involved. I give them a, a bunch of different suggestions on how to how to handle those calls, how to investigate them, resources to bring to bear, whether it's King County Guardian One, if you're here in Seattle, which is the, the county helicopter because they have FLIR on their helicopters and can search a wider area quicker than officers on foot or in a car. Um, I talk about, you know, even things like Facebook or, or you, you know, Facebook or Twitter putting out uh, community notifications and stuff like that. There's just a, a, a really huge segment on missing persons and how, how we can best respond to those and stuff like that. Um, okay, Chris. In, a, in sure. a, a yeah, in a bit here, I'm hoping you'll tell us a little bit about um, uh, the logistics <clears throat> if a parent is is missing or can't find their kid, and they didn't the kid didn't tell them where they were going, um, and and how to do that. But before we do, I know Karen sure. has to leave in three minutes, uh, and so uh, and there's also a question in the chat there uh, from from a parent, uh, and I'm going to tell you what it is, but we'll. 
uh, go in with Karen. The comments are in that other comment there about um, teaching uh, school security, uh, some of the skills. So we need you to be teaching this to even more people. Uh, Chris is part of that. But before we go, Karen, uh, I was going to ask you a bit about about Caden when he was little and he wasn't speaking. Um, and I know I don't know you wrap it into three minutes, but maybe maybe if you had something you kind of want to share some parting words before you jump uh, jump off and head towards your next destination. I know I'll t I can go a little I can be here a little bit longer. Um, yeah. So is your question like just what it was like when he because he was nonverbal for his first like seven yep. years? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, you, you know, Chris, um, first of all, thank you so much, Chris. I want to share how important it is, the work that you're doing. Um, I I wish you could make that something that happens everywhere. Um, Can I interrupt and tell you one thing real quick yeah. rel relative to that? So. Uh, my class actually just got added to the State Police Academy curriculum. So starting this month, every recruit, uh, every police recruit in the state from here on out will we'll get my class. So there's there's that to look forward to. Thank you. And I'm happy I will come anytime you request. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, it's an open anytime. invitation. Anytime. And maybe Caden will come too. Um, when he was, you mentioned um, missing. So my son, when he was three, so he was nonverbal for his first seven years um, of life. And um, when he was about three, he went missing in the mall. And um, he loved, um, not Thomas the Train, he loved the rocket. Um, we're going on a trip. Anyway, and he went to the Disney store. <laughs> So he left the play area and he went to the Disney store and a security officer, I know there was a question about security, um, found, you know, I guess saw him, he had no shoes on because he was playing in the play area with no shoes on. And he went to Disney because he wanted to look at the rocket, I guess. And here he comes walking down the mall with the security officer holding his hand, but he can't, couldn't communicate. So, you know, one thing I think that's really important. So if I could just share that um, it's very important. I have no problem. And I, please, parents out there listening, let people know what you're dealing with. Like I have a child with autism. I, I'm, I, I, I and everyone parents differently, but I let people know my son has autism. I'm on the plane. Excuse me. My son has autism and he may hit the back or do something, but he means no harm. We'll take care of it because I've had people yell at me on a plane before. So I let people know I'm at the store. He wants to pay. He wants to talk to the person. At the right. He wants to put the groceries in the back. My, you know, my son, my son has autism and he enjoys this. It's okay. Like I, I have no, like some people are like, well, no, I don't, I don't want to let people know and let them just, you know, but for me, everybody has their, but for me, I want people to know what you're dealing with. It's already difficult for him. I don't, I need to let people know to give him some grace. So that's another, another is around determining when it was time for him to go to school and it was very challenging. I wanted him to be mainstream by kindergarten. I mean, he was 18 months. I knew there was a possibility, but no, the kindergarten teacher who, where he would have gone, the school system, she says, they said to me, thank you. Cause they had my daughter prior and they said, thank you. And I said, for what? And they said, for getting Caden what he needs. Cause it's not about me. So as a parent, it's not about me. So what I wanted him to go mainstream. That's not what he needed. And that only would set him up for failure. And everyone in the class on the teacher, why would I do that? Give the give your child what they need. Set them up for success. And but recognize what you have and embrace that. And then take your time. If they're not ready, you're not ready. If you're if they're ready, you need to get ready. And so one of the things my motto was let go to grow. I said that every day, let go to grow let go to grow because he's my baby he's my baby but he's not a baby anymore and he wants independence he likes to cook for his own food he likes to 
do his own thing. I, I let him do that. And so I think I would just say that, you know, let them tell you where they need to be. You know, let them tell you and be there for them and let go to grow. But I tell you, Chris, thank you so much for all that you are doing, John. I, <laughs> I thank you for what you're doing. And um, if ever I can help, I'm a huge advocate for autism and for my, my boy and others. And, um, and I love to help parents um, get through this because it's not easy, but but you know it's their ch it's your child and there's no nothing more precious. So I'm happy to help and to support the police department in any way that you need. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I like. I, I guarantee you we will be in contact. Uh, absolutely, I guarantee you and I will be in contact. Well, thank you so much, Karen. We're gonna let you go so that you don't miss your flights. Um, and I'll say you're already being quoted on the internet. Uh, let go to grow. So uh, I'm glad you fit it in there. <laughs> Because that was that's some powerful words, and I want to thank you so much for your time today. And uh, thank good you. luck on your trip. Thank you for having the conversation. Thanks, everybody. Awesome. Thanks, have Karen. to come back later. All right. Okay. okay. Bye. 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 All right. I definitely want to get some more. Uh, I've got some more questions for Tracy and Sydney, but there were some great questions in the the chat from out in the nether world. Um, and one of them specifically, I, I kind of mentioned briefly, Chris, but maybe you want to respond to about. Um, teaching security school officers uh, about having correct, is that something that's been on your radar? Well, so uh, I think I think you're aware of this because I, I think I mentioned this to you. Uh, last, last summer I was down in San Diego and because the San Diego Unified School District Police Department, uh, they, they had seen my class at a, at a CIT International Conference. And so they wanted to bring me down and I actually taught my class to the, the regional school resource officer conference down in, in uh, San Diego County. And so it, it's, it's out there as far as, you know, those are, those are actually police officers that work as school resource officers in the schools. But I, you know, I read the question there and I, I think, uh, I mean, you can, you can, you can answer this as well as I can. I think my class, the way that I, I, I present it and I design it, I think it would, it would directly transfer over to school resource officers. Um, you know, I, my class is, you know, initially designed for police officers, but I can, you know, I can tell you, uh, you, the, the, the three other folks I'm talking to, and then you, you and the, you know, the, the nether of the internet. Um, I've taught this so many times I can't even keep track of to not just, not just cops, but civilians and clinicians and parent, you know, autism parents and family members and, and, uh, people on the spectrum themselves. Like it's not just a class that I've only presented to, to law enforcement. It's, it's been, I, I can even give you the full list of everybody who I've taught this class to and let sit in on it and stuff like that. So I, I think that relative to that, that question, I think it would transfer over just, it, it's, it's not necessarily, I mean, there's a lot of for law enforcement, but, but I believe, and again, yeah. you can, you can interject because you, you saw it from a different perspective. There's, there's a lot of stuff in my class that, is not as much as it is law enforcement specific. There's a lot of stuff that is not necessarily law enforcement specific, if that makes sense. It's, it's like about yeah. Yeah, I think just human behavior, really, I guess is how I look at it. Totally, Chris. Um, and so I, th I think that the resounding answer to that is yes. Uh, and so if people are interested in that, you know, maybe reaching out to Seattle Police Department and seeing if they can connect with you um, to, to get that, um, Oh, and there was a question if you had a, a a link to the program that you teach or how, how would people, uh, if they were interested in having that taught to their uh, school or other things? Um, they, could they, they could contact me through the Seattle Police Department, I guess. Um, I, I don't really have a link just because I um, it's not something that like the, the PowerPoint slideshow is not just it's not posted online. It's it's more of just the class right like the there's a lot of stuff in the powerpoint that if you just look at it it might not necessarily make sense because right um all, all of the curriculum a lot of it is in my brain it's not all yeah. just there on the slide if that makes sense chris i'd say you were the magic ingredient in those classes <laughs> so uh so it sounds like that's how i found you is i just contacted the seattle police department <laughs> i said i yeah. want to talk about this and i got directed to you towards you so it sounds like 
uh, others who are listening might be able to do a similar thing. And uh, Chris Christman would be the person you want to get in contact with. Um, excellent, Chris. I'm gonna I'm gonna switch over to Sydney for a little bit here. I've got a question for her because um, I this is a question I get a lot from parents as well too, and so it's partly why I wanted to ask you about it. Uh, and I really enjoyed when you told you told me about how you learn to drive. Um, and that's another big safety thing that you have, you concern when you drive, but also um, sounds like learning to drive took a lot of persistence on your part. And many times, and I guess, how many times did you have to take your driver's permit test? I think you told me. Um, it was about five times that I had to take my learner's permit test. And then it took me twice to take the driving test. And um, my parents were so nervous about learning teaching me how to drive the first time was because I'm the youngest child and I was 18 years old and it was my first time driving and so I was so scared like for my driving test I was so nervous and really scared that I actually flunked it the first time but the second time I, I took it I was more confident I was more prepared and more ready and that's how I passed it no, that's awesome. And I think part you told me too, like there, there were a lot of people involved in helping to teach you like your parents and driving instructors and, and what struck me the most was how you persevered. And like, even though it wasn't a simple, easy thing, like you continued and now you have your own car and drive everywhere. Yes, I own a 2021 Subaru Crosstrek here in Spokane. Excellent. It's given me more opportunities and more freedom in the to be more involved in the community. No, that is that is awesome, and I think a lot. It's inspiring, I think, for a lot of parents who wonder about that kind of thing for their kids. And I know um, their kids who become adults; they still call them kids. But uh, and I know you. Yeah, uh, when you drive, you you have to think a lot about safety. Is that right? That's something you think a lot about. Yes, I do think a lot about my safety and I just worry that I might get into an accident because there's a lot of drivers out on the road and they're a lot worse than they are in, than they were in Alaska. <laughs> I hear you. Living in Seattle, I can totally relate. Um, thank you, Sydney. I also want to give Tracy a chance to pop in here too again with some of her great tidbits, um, knowing we've got about five more minutes just you know parent to parents those listening out there kind of what kind of advice would you give what have you learned on your journey like what are some things you'd like to share um, oh gosh <laughs> um it's unending um because e each part of the journey is is different um and you're dealing with so many different stages in their lives and and things like that but um a couple of things that popped into my mind i remember when ben was little he would have like two and a half hour temper tantrums, meltdowns, and um, just like waiting for somebody to call the police on us or something and knock on the door because once he started, he just couldn't stop. Um, and um, he couldn't communicate at that time either. So it was just really challenging. So it was um, very nerve wracking to think that somebody might question uh, your parenting and what you're doing and, and things like that. Um, and it made you nervous. Um, another thing too that I wanted to mention, a lot of talk was talking about like a missing child, water, um, communications and things like that. Um, I just wanted to highlight too that we do at Ben's Fund, we do a lot of iPads for, um, for kids and young adults who have a hard time communicating. There's a lot of apps out there that can really assist in that. Um, we also do a lot of like angel sense which is um, a tracking device that parents can utilize for their kiddos, especially those who love to take off. Um, I know we had one of those as well. Um, I continually to this day um, use Life360 um, to track Ben um, because that gives a lot of great information um, and I know where he is at all times. Um, so that is a massive thing. And also with Ben's Fund, we do a lot of, um, we do a lot of grants for swimming lessons. Um, to make sure kids are taught how to swim um, and just increase that that safety factor with them. Um, we do a lot of stuff for the homes too, like we'll provide different 
different locks and things like that for people to utilize in their homes um, if they have little escape artists um, and um, you know so there's so many things too that are out there um, you know that can really help provide a lot of support um, for our kiddos no matter what part of the journey that they're on um, but I echo a lot of what Karen said too um, you have to have a lot of patience um, a lot of understanding and I actually wrote this down before the call, helping them with where they're at. And that kind of echoes what Karen said as well. It's not, um, you know, you have to respect um, them as, as an individual and where are they at and what are they struggling with and what are they having a hard time with. And that's our responsibility as parents is to help them through that, right? And to help them with what they're dealing with at that time. And it changes and it changes a lot. Um, you know, when Ben moved out, um, people, <laughs> my mom was like, he's not moving out of your house. And I'm like, he might be because that's what he really needs, um, which created, you know, we had a lot of other factors that, that went into him moving on his own and just supporting them and where they're at and listening to them and making them feel heard, um, just like any of our kids, but especially... Um, you know, with Ben, it's like, I get you, I'm hearing you, I'm understanding you, and I'm here to help you. Um, and I asked Ben too, um, I said, what would you want to share with other kids or young adults that have autism? Um, and he said, and I quote, don't let autism define who you are. Um, he has always, you know, kind of just done he's been him. I mean, he's been, um, but I agree with Karen. I always told people that he has autism because I wanted him to be understood. Um, and I wanted people to give him a little grace and a little understanding. Um, even now I'll take, you know, the last time I took him into a hospital, um, for an appointment, um, he was spinning down the hallway. So, you know, you have <laughs> this skinny, uh, young adult with his hood up, and he's spinning down the hallway and you know so it's just always hoping that people have some grace have some understanding have some patience um and can try to understand something that they might not otherwise tracy is so well said you summarized so many things in your <laughs> comment there it was just perfect um the swim lessons huge advocate for that yeah. uh i write I write a lot of those letters in support of Ben's fund, and I can only echo that those are uh, definitely things that we're requesting the angel sends, the door alarms, the mm -hmm. iPads for communication, just so many, so many, many, many things there. And I know it's eight o'clock uh, and we should be ending at eight. I do want to give Chris like a last minute if he's got something else to share with people. I will throw out there too. There's a lot of questions. There were questions about like, should parents introduce their kids to law enforcement kind of like you do with like firefighters sometimes like you introduce your kids to firefighters and and kind of your thought on that but if you had other thoughts too i'll give you another uh, well, minute or two first, sorry i didn't mean to talk over you my, no, my first thought was uh i don't know how to follow what tracy just said so eloquently and like like how do i don't know how do i follow that up i guess i was sitting here thinking um you know as far as should you introduce your your children to to police and fire uh, you know, I lean towards saying yes, but the, the, I guess when I analyze that from a law enforcement perspective, I, I try to think of like, some of that is going to be situationally dependent on where you live, the, you know, police department or fire department for the city that you live in and, and, uh, processes or things that support that they may have or may not have in place. So that's, that's going to, it's going to be a little bit dependent on that, I guess, is, is, I mean, I would say, yeah, if you can, if there's a way, like, like Tracy said, she, she did with the local police department where, where Ben lives. So, yeah, I mean, if that's available, absolutely. Um, you know, if, if you'd like some sort of assistance doing that, I'm sure there's going to be some, some link to where people can contact me. Uh, I'm absolutely uh, willing to be some sort of a go between buffer contact reacher outer whatever whatever the word would be right i'm i'm absolutely uh, more than willing to to help assist if i can um so there's that um 
did I miss one of you? Sorry if, if I missed one. No, of, no, you, you did perfect. Actually, Chris, okay. you did perfect. Um, so I, uh, well, I'm going to wrap things up a little bit here. I did want to put out if you do want to contact Chris or, or anyone tonight because you had other questions or, or things like that, do reach out to us at conversations about autism at seattlechildrens.org and uh, we will do that connecting for you. Matchmaking, maybe that's the term. I did want to flash up real quick. We have a, a slide with just a few simple, basic uh, resources. If you've got a phone with a QR code reader, you can do that or you can go to those websites. The first is through Autism Speaks. They have a wonderful safety toolkit, goes through lots of different um, resources. Uh, also, the Autistic Self-Advocate Network, ASAN, has another wonderful autism and safety toolkit that you can link on there. And last but not least, there is an agency called Nurturing Water Therapies uh, that has some free water safety instruction videos. Uh, if you link on there, it takes you to that training courses. They also have some others for sale and things like that, that you know, maybe you need some dense funds uh, for help with. But um, just to kind of get you some ideas on how to familiarize your children with water safety, promoting water safety and some of those kinds of things, because I know a lot of parents aren't even sure where to begin sometimes. Um, and yeah, so I want to thank everyone for your time here tonight. Uh, thank you for hanging on the extra three minutes, four minutes. And I want to thank our participants because this has just been a wonderful, probably one of the very best we've had so far. Thank you all for your time um, and good night. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having us.